Okay, time to do all the other stuff. I'll be there in a second. Don't go away. All right. Oh, it takes so long. It takes so long. Okay. All right, all that is. Shut up. Shut up, Tad. Shut up. Okay, what's on my mind? Facebook wants to know. Funny you should ask. Mark and Company. Because this is what's on my mind. Reading now and being bombarded with messages about my frames per second rate being insufficient. Okay. And that's all right. I, I can I can live with that. I can because I can't figure it out. All right. Okie dokie. I think that should do it. Yes, and my frame rate's too low, it still says. Go away. Stop it. Okay, hello. I'm Tad. Good to see you. Um, nice to be with you. I'm going to be reading, and I'm pretty sure we're going to be finishing Dragons of Ordinary Farm tonight. Um, I'll give the folks who are here this evening a chance, if you haven't chimed in already, on what is going to be read next. The two options, to count them to, the two options that I have provided are the follow-up Ordinary Farm book or the first other land book. Um, and people voted last night, and I have, best I could, tabulated those results. Makes it sound very official, doesn't it? I have tabulated those results, and um, I will see what any of you have to say tonight, because I'm almost certainly going to finish. While I am giving out messages about that, and I'll mention it again later, um, if when I get to the end of the book tonight, even if it's like only quarter till or something, I'm just going to pack it up instead of just filling time, because um, I'm not going to start a new book, and I... There's only so much time I can babble at you about other things. I'm going to do my babbling right now just to get the babblage out of the way. The babblery, the whatever you want to call it. Um, so, again, just to let you know ahead of time, if we finish the book early, as I expect we very well might, um, I'm just going to say goodnight at that point and wrap it up um, just because it's been a long week. And I'm not going to force any of you to listen to me filling time, um, which is horrifying. I, I, I did it for years on radio. I've done it here. Um, and uh, it's not that I mind doing it so much. I mind forcing it on all of you uh, who are kind enough to join me. So anyway, in the interim, what else is there to mention? Um, we, we checked in with our UK friends and family today, as we often do on Sundays. We worked or did some work. I did some work. Deb did some work. Um, I have no idea what the kids did because they were behind closed doors all day. So they could have been, I don't know, preparing to overthrow uh, the government and install a new world order of young people, um, which basically doesn't worry me too much because nothing will ever get done. <laughs> so it's not like... Terrible changes will come. They'll be like all this, like, yeah, we're going to make it illegal for grown-ups to vote next week or the week after. I don't know, man. I'm really slammed. Uh, maybe, like, after Christmas sometime? Yeah. No, wait. I have to go skiing. Okay. Um, yeah, let's do it. Oh, man, I don't know. This is hard. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure some of you out there have extremely organized young people living in your house. Uh, such is not the case with us. Well, they're very organized when it comes to things that they are interested in, like putting together a D and D session or organizing to go out to a, a movie or something or things like that. But in terms of things like cleaning a room, 
much different kind of set of affairs. Anyway, so what else? As you can see, I mentioned this last night, the Mylar balloons are holding firm, even though it's been like 10 days since the birthday they were brought in for, but Mylar does not give up. Mylar does not exhale its helium into the atmosphere in the same way that uh, rubber, old-fashioned rubber balloons do. So God knows how long. I'm, I'm kind of tempted just to leave them now and just to see how long they last. My experience with these things, like in the kids' rooms and stuff, is that they slowly float down over a period of many, many days, sometimes weeks. And then eventually they're just, their own weight keeps them just barely off the ground, just you know, like that. And every time you try to walk through the room, unless it's one of the kids' rooms, in which case you can't walk through them anyway, um, you're kicking balloons around. Um, but so anyway, that's the kind of thing that I actually think about. I, I, my brain does not work properly, as probably everybody has figured out by now. It's just doesn't does not work, um, at least not in any use, useful and reasonable way. And instead, I spend all my time thinking about mylar balloons and what they're like and remembering things like the mystery science theater episode about the day the earth froze and the giant bags of wind that talk and all those things and, and other various odd things that nobody needs to know about at least nobody who has a real life um what else anything else i have to tell you about obviously um brothers of the wind is out most places i think it's just coming out in england but it's out most places so those of you who wanted to get a copy can now have a copy um, as I always say, yes, I love it when people buy my books because this keeps my family from starving, but I don't want your family starving to buy one of my books. So if it's, a, if it's an expensive um, luxury that you can't afford, that's what libraries are for. That's what libraries are for. Um, anyway, what else? Mm, I'm working on just finishing up the last uh, stitches and tatters and bits of um, Into the Narrow Dark which of course is now volume three of the four volume Last King of Ostenard. And um, then I can finally jump on to finishing uh, The Navigator's Children, which is now made more difficult because I've been given some, I've been spending so much time rewriting the uh, Into the Narrow Dark that now I've changed a bunch of things that I have to fix in uh, Navigator's Children, as well as writing the last 200 pages. Fortunately, I'm a fairly fast writer. Um, and that is more to do with the fact that I literally don't do anything else these days during, during the day, seven days a week, um, is either write or think about what I'm writing or, you know, all kinds of things like that. It's not a good thing. I don't suggest it, but if I take days off, I find myself frustrated that I can't work. If I try and go back in the evening, I'm tired and stupid and I can't work. So pretty much I just have to work during the daytime as much as possible. And at the moment, it's particularly gritty because there's just a lot of work to do. This will all get better sometime in the spring. So we will see. Anyway, last thing to remind you before we go back to the book and before I say hello to everybody is to remind you that, first of all, I may just stop tonight if we finish the book early um, instead of forcing you to listen through 20 minutes of me talking about household chores or whatever and that um, I am open to more votes on whether we should dive into the first book of the other land series City of Golden Shadow or um, read the second um, Dragons of Ordinary Farm and I'm fine either way as I mentioned at, at some length last night, but I will mention it now, the reason I'm not reading any of, I'm not volunteering to read any of the Ostenard novels, or Ostenard, you can say it either way, I don't care. I've never cared about that stuff. People can pronounce these names exactly as they want to, and when you come up to me at a convention or some kind of event, book signing, you know, don't worry if you think you're going to say the name wrong, because it's absolutely going to mean nothing to me. As I've said many times, um, I pronounce many of the names wrong because I created the names before I created the rules of the regional languages and things in all my books. And um, that even my publishers can't keep up with, you know, there's so many characters. I've, I've made so many characters over the years, literally thousands that, you know, even my publishers can't keep up. And they used to call Priorities that guy whose name starts with a P. 
That, literally, that's what they would call him because they could never remember what exactly it was. So anyway, back to Ostinard for a moment. The reason I'm not reading any Ostinard is because I've been basically working on it seven days a week since 2014. Um, and uh, I'm very glad I've been doing that and I'm enjoying the heck out of it and I will probably return to Ostinard at some point not too far in the future after this. But I'm not really down to read a bunch of it right now. It just would be a little too much for me. So that up the line if I'm still doing this, very possible. Anyway, so those are your two options um, if you want to make a vote. And now I'm going to go say hello to people and then we're going to get on with the reading. Comments. No, I don't want that. I want, oh, God help me. Just please. Oh, you wretched people. Um, they have so mangled this. All right. All right. Let's see if we can figure out. Of course, there's no times on these, so I can't tell what order they came in on. Oh, God, I hate this stuff. Anyway, so let me just say hello to people. So who have we got? Medarvo. Good to see you. Oh, now it's switched again. And that Medarvo just moved down to the bottom, I think. Why can I not just get the stupid things? Sorry, folks. I realize this seems like the, the ultimate boomer moment here, that I'm just sitting here complaining and complaining about things. But honest to God, I'm pretty good with this stuff, and it's just incomprehensible. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go through the comments as I can see them at the moment, and I apologize if I'm doing anything wrong or missing anybody, because the, the comments will not allow me to go back to um, from newest to oldest or oldest to newest. Anyway, Barban, hello. Medardo, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to say hello to you properly right literally in the middle of that. It disappeared. But hello, Medardo, I saw you. Barban, hello, good to see you. Jeremy, a pleasure, as always, my friend. Kristen, hello, nice to see you too. Mahmoud, um, and you're going to go back to sleep well. Good night, sleep well, sweet dreams. James, hello, and you're going to take Brothers of the Wind to the park. Good thinking. Um, I'm very much in favor of getting out of the house. I haven't been doing it much lately. Timothy, hello, good to see you. And, uh, oh, and you're reading it too. Excellent. Glad to hear it. All right. There's some more votes for other land, other land, other land. Well, we're certainly leaning toward other land. Um, I think so far that other land is kind of way out in front. But uh, so who else is here that I haven't said hello to? Um, James and stop that. Don't roll the whole thing. Just that section. James, Timothy. Hello, Timothy. Kristen, I already said hello to. Claudia, good to see you. Kenneth. Kenneth K. Nice to see you too. Jared, a pleasure. Alan, I think I already said hello to you, but if not, hello, Alan. Alan DC. And Becca, hello, Becca. Um, who, uh, do a reading after sucking on helium. Oh my God, that is horrifying. Um, Jeremy wants to know if I'm going to finish two partridges, one pear tree. Yeah, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do my best. Unfortunately, I'm right in the absolute pit of deadline. Um, so, yeah, anybody can vote. Anybody can vote, Mahmoud. Um, James says when Tad complains about his young people, he thinks of Rachel the dragon. Yeah, there's probably some of that in there, um, <laughs> some Rachel aspect. Uh, I don't say mer merciful Saint Reap, but otherwise I'm somewhat similar. Chris Van Dahl, good to see you too. Um, and Jeremy's other brother chimes in with Bobby Bobby Dollar question. Carl, hello, Carl. Ron, hello, Ron. Good to see you. Ron says he's enjoying Brothers of the Wind. Well, Ron has gets a lot of the credit, um, along with several other people here, including Jeremy, who I just said hello to, for help with that book. Because as I've mentioned before, I don't think I could be doing Ostenard, Ostenard, um, without all the nice people who've been helping me to remember all the things that I've put in these books and can't remember now. So Nancy votes for Otherland also. Sasha, hello. Um, good to see you. Getting feed cutouts. Yeah, there's this whole thing is messed up, and I cannot figure out why or what it wants me to do. I've been trying for as long as this, this whole process has been since they changed um, what was going on. I'm still on the same thing. I'm still on Facebook. I'm still on Chrome, but they keep changing things. And the last time they changed it, all of a sudden it said, you know, your frame rate is, 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 is insufficient. But I swear to God, I have gone to the thing like five times trying to figure out how to change the frame rate. 
or whatever, and I can make no sense out of it. And again, I'm the guy who does all that stuff in our household. You know, I'm the one who helps people figure out, you know, how to get signed into things or, you know, when something's not working, I'm the one who figures out which part of the chain of components it is that's not functioning properly and all that stuff. So I'm not, you know, I'm not some helpless boomer who's just like, well, uh, geez, uh, this thing, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not my dad who still leaves the <laughs> lesson, who still has his original factory um, password on his, his router. So whenever we go over to, our house, over to their place and the kids want to use the router, they have to go back and ask dad because nobody can remember a password that long. It's like 20 characters of just random letters and numbers. And we're like, dad, just change it to something. Change it to dad's password. Nobody's going to bother to hack your thing, you know. No. Anyway, but for some reason, this has been a complete mystery to me why this is happening, why the settings are, are, are constantly telling me that the stream rate is wrong, and uh, it, it just doesn't make any sense at all. It's absolutely pointless and crazy. So anyway, what I am going to do now is I am going to start reading. And as I mentioned, I'm going to just read to the end of the book because I think pretty much we're almost there, and I apologize, but that's just a fact. So I'm going to go back a little tiny bit. Um, so for those of you who were not listening last night, and I don't blame you for not trying to get into both broadcasts um, in quick succession, um, there are many things going on. We, you probably remember that Lucinda was snagged in the dragon's harness, and Lucinda has been flying around dangling from the dragon's harness as the dragon takes flight in search of whoever stole the egg, which we know at this point is Colin. And um, I think in the section that I just finished reading, Lucinda managed to climb back up on top of the dragon, and then the dragon has crashed into um, the helicopter, and that's all we know. So actually, I'm going to step back here a couple of days, a couple of pages um, to where things start. Actually, I'm just going to start with chap how many chapters have we got here? 29. I think this all happens. I think there's like one chapter left after that. God, wouldn't it be funny if this was like a copy of the book that didn't have the last chapter? Okay, anyway, I'm going to start chapter 29 again. I'm going to read it. So chapter 29 is called The Devil's Bargain. Those of you who heard this last night, you may go and get yourself some crackers and cheese or whatever. This will take about five, eight minutes for me to catch up. Why are we running? Asked Steve Carrillo, struggling for breath. I'm tired of running. I've been running and hiding for days. Tyler stopped to let them all catch their breath. Because you really need to get off this property. Just trust me on that. Carmen straightened up and pushed her hair out of her face. Running and hiding? You spent the whole day yesterday lying on your back playing coils of the man serpent. You fell asleep with a controller in your hands. I'm not talking about that yesterday. I was in that mirror for days, Steve said. It just didn't seem like it to you. We're going to be hearing this for years, Carmen said. Steve, is your room clean? Couldn't do it, Mom. I fell into a mirror and I was gone for like a month. Little Alma patted her brother's arm. I believe you, Stevie. Tyler snorted. Yeah, this is all great, but I really suggest we get moving again before something a lot worse than the mirror happens to us. Like getting caught by guys with a helicopter and probably with guns this time. He'd have to get the Koreas going their own way before they reached the edge of the property where the copter had been. What did that Stillman guy want anyway? And how had he found out there was anything unusual about Ordinary Farm? They were out well beyond the last buildings, moving across the open hillsides on the far side of the valley, scuttling in and out among the cottonwoods and the stunted oak trees. Steve was still complaining, but not so often or so loudly. He didn't have the breath. Tyler was just trying to decide if it was time to send the Carrillos off on their own when a massive dark shape loomed up out of the shadows, spreading its arms wide. Carmen, who was ahead of the others, almost ran right into it. She shrieked and lost her balance, then fell and began to roll down the steep hillside. The thing leaped after her, bulky but quick as a hungry bear, 
and pinned her to the ground before she rolled more than a dozen yards. Tyler was frozen with fear until he saw the shadow bend over the panting, terrified girl. He grabbed the first thing that came to hand, a piece of fallen branch, not much bigger than his flashlight, and sprang down the slope. Leave her alone, he shouted. Shut your mouth, the shadowy figure growled at him. And if you swing that at me, boy, I will beat your skin off. Ragnar? Tyler scrambled down the hill. Is that you? Yes, me. He lifted Carmen up as though she was no heavier than a rag doll. The question is, what are the rest of you doing here? Back at the top of the hill, Ragnar set Carmen on her feet, not particularly gently, and stared down at them all. I am not playing a child's game. Tell me quick why you are here. If you are the ones who fooled me with that glove, you have bought more than a handful of trouble. What glove? Tyler asked. But when he saw the cold, angry expression on Ragnar's bearded face, he decided maybe he would do better answering instead of asking. And you swear this is the truth? Ragnar said when Tyler had finished. It's true, said Amma. The voice was small, but surprisingly firm. We wouldn't lie to you, Ragnar. He stared at her, then at her sister and brother, and turned at last to Tyler. I don't think they would lie, but I know you have kept back truth before that you did not want to share. Is that so now? Tyler stared at him. He had kept back the story of the woman in the mirror, the one he thought was Grace. He didn't know why, but he still felt there were things going on that he needed to figure out before he could completely trust anyone, even Ragnar. I've told you all I can, he said at last, and did his best to hold Ragnar's eye. So now you have to decide whether you're going to trust me. Ragnar leaned toward him, lowering his voice to a whisper so that the Carrillos couldn't hear. Do not get above yourself, Tyler Jenkins. You learned much this summer, but the dangers here are greater than you have even guessed. After a moment, he straightened up. A glove was left on the fence to lure Simos and me away from the Junction Road side of the farm. Someone has played a trick on us. If it was not any of you, it was likely one of our enemies. Tyler, take these children back to their house. You three swear to me that you will tell no one, not your parents or other friends, no one, what you've seen and heard here. Swear. We promise, said Alma promptly. Her older brother and sister looked at each other, but then agreed. Hurry then, follow me until you reach the farm road, then Tyler will lead you home. They ran then. Within only a few hundred yards, Ragnar was far in front, lost to sight among the trees despite the bright moonlight. Tyler had just turned back to encourage Steve, who was lagging behind again, when something huge plummeted out of the sky, blocking the stars and, for one terrifying second, even the moon. Carmen shouted in surprise. Steve tripped and fell. For the first second or two, Tyler thought it was the helicopter bearing down on them like something in a war movie, but the thing was almost entirely silent. No helicopter sounds at all. And then a thin voice full of panic floated to him from high above, a voice he thought he recognized. No, no, don't. The wind of the monster's passage knocked Tyler back a few steps as its huge shadow swept over him, wings spread wide, tail stretching over him like a knife slash of blackness against the midnight blue sky. Then it was gone. Steve stumbled to his feet. Whoa! Do you know what that was? Even by moonlight, Tyler could see the strange, rapt expression on Alma's face as she stared after the departing dragon. Grandma Paz was right, she said. It is the door to another world. That was Lucinda up there. Tyler said. His insides felt like a block of ice. Lucinda! But what would she be doing up there with that giant creature unless she was in the dragon's mouth? 
he began to run again, even faster. With the Carrillos behind him, he charged up the last yards to the top of the hill. As they reached the summit, Tyler could suddenly hear the sounds of a real helicopter, the steady, quiet flop, flop, flop of its blades as it idled on the grassy valley floor. It was waiting for something. Its running lights and the light spilling from its open door showed a last passenger clambering up the stairs. Then the door slammed shut and the blades sped into invisibility. The helicopter began to rise. That's Ragnar running down the hill, Steve said, pointing at a figure racing toward the scene, but still far from the rising helicopter, which was now at least 20 feet off the ground. He'll never get, Tyler began. Then a huge bat-like shape dropped out of the sky. As he watched in horror, it smashed into the side of the helicopter, just below the rotors, with a tremendous thump like a clap of thunder. The helicopter pitched to one side, wallowed for a moment in midair, then dropped unsteadily to the ground, but somehow managed to land on its skids. The dragon had fallen into darkness. Lucinda! Tyler shouted, but someone grabbed at his arm. It was Carmen. Sparks began to pop from the doorway of the helicopter where it stood on the ground, its propeller still rotating. Don't, she said, those are guns. And now Tyler heard the cracks, distant but sharp as hammer blows. What's going on? Why are they shooting? Maybe because they just got knocked out of the sky by a giant dinosaur with wings, Carmen said. You think? But my sister, my sister was on that dragon. Steve Correa stumbled up and stood, wheezing. No wonder you guys never call us. Sounds like you've been pretty busy. Suddenly the field was splashed with light. The helicopter crew had switched the searchlights on, turning the area around the idling chopper bright as day. A shape was running away from the helicopter toward Ragnar, who waved his arms from the other side of the meadow as if urging the figure on. But more pops and flashes came from the door of the helicopter, and Ragnar had to duck down. Whoever that is, he'll never make it! squealed Carmen. Then a new shape came from somewhere behind the helicopter, moving over the grassy ground in a blur, fast as a rabbit, but bigger, much bigger. Even with the bright helicopter searchlights, Tyler could not make sense of it, as it snatched up the figure escaping the chopper, threw it over a shoulder, and ran toward them, moving with what seemed like impossible speed. As the figure sped past Ragnar, the Viking turned and followed it. A last few gunshots cracked from the helicopter. Then someone pulled the door closed and the aircraft started to rise once more. This time, no dragon dropped out of the sky. And although the engines had a rougher sound than before, the helicopter kept rising until it was a couple of hundred feet off the ground. Then it sped away west, its lights rapidly getting smaller until it was lost in the darkness. The hairy, goat-legged figure slung Colin Needle off its shoulder and dumped the stunned boy to the ground, then put down what looked like Colin's backpack. The goat man hesitated, then turned to look at the Carrillos, who were staring wide-eyed. Simos Walkwell looked sad. Why are you here, children? He looked down at himself. Why? I did not want you to see this. Steve and Carmen could only stare, but Alma actually smiled at him. I saw you run, Mr. Walkwell, so fast. You were, you were beautiful. They found Meseret lying in a heap, almost a quarter mile from where the helicopter had been forced down. Ragnar bent to hold his hand near her nostrils, which were as big as dinner plates. She breathes, he said. She seems to be asleep. Perhaps she is not too badly hurt. She's drugged, said a voice from the shadows. Lucinda limped into view. Loose! Tyler ran to her and hugged her, folding himself into her warmth. I thought you were dead. I did too. 
especially when she hit the ground and I got thrown. She patted his back and gently pulled away, not because she didn't want to hug him, he realized, but because it hurt. She was staggering a little as she walked toward the others, so Tyler gave her his arm to lean on. Haneb gave her a shot just before she broke out, she told Ragnar. Then she saw the Carrillos. She smiled a little. Everybody seemed to have given up trying to get them to go home, Tyler thought with wry amusement. There didn't seem much point now. Hi, guys. You still here? Anyway, Meseret was losing consciousness before she got here, I think. It was just determination. She was after her egg. Ragnar lifted up the backpack. You know, it is here. What we do not know is how it got here when we thought it had been destroyed by Alamu. Alamu had nothing to do with it. Haneb took it. He says that Colin made him do it. She turned toward Colin. What were you thinking, Colin? That was so stupid. And now the secret's out. I am not certain of that, said a voice. Seamos Walkwell was still naked except for the bristly hair that covered his entire lower body. He stood up from examining the dragon and walked back to them. I heard them arguing when they were on the ground, as Colin was running away. They did not know what had knocked them from the sky. They saw nothing of me either, I think. I moved fast and kept to the shadows until I was far away from them. He turned to the Carrillos. If these young ones can be trusted, and I hope that they can, it could be our secret is safe for a little while longer. Tyler couldn't stand it anymore. But it's not safe. That Stillman guy is going to be even more certain that something unusual is going on here, and I think it's, pretty, it's a pretty safe bet. It's all his fault. He turned to Colin. How much were you going to get for selling us out, Needle? What were you going to do with it anyway? It's not like you ever do anything except sneak around and rat on people to your mother. That's a lie, Colin shouted, and his anger surprised even Tyler. I don't tell my mother anything. I want what's best for the farm. I, I never, I, I never. He broke off, muttering angrily, staring down at his shoes. What's best for the farm, Tyler said. You liar. You were going to sell a dragon's egg to that creep Stillman. Oh, grow up, Jenkins, Colin snapped. I don't know if you can hear it, but the cat right in this climactic and exciting part of the story, the cat is having a hairball over on her chair. Oh, grow up, Jenkins, Colin snapped. I was doing it to make the farm some money. We're in debt up to our eyeballs, and it's going to get worse. How do you think Gideon's kept this place going for so long? He used to bring all kinds of things back from trips through the fault line, all old things from the past, and sell them as archaeological treasures. At least that's what he did, till the continuous scope was lost in the lab fire. Now he can't find his way around in the fault line anymore. And Stillman was the guy buying them, but he's not going to do it any longer. This was our last chance to get any money out of him. Ragnar said, You are a stupid little boy, Colin Needle. His voice was full of contempt. You have given away everything. You put a dragon's egg in that man's hand. Colin shook his head. He thinks it's a dinosaur egg. Just really well preserved. I can't believe you do that, Colin. Lucinda slumped a little against Tyler. He could feel her trembling with exhaustion. I can't believe you'd do that to Gideon. Colin's eyes filled with tears, but his face was angry. Gideon? Are you joking? He's letting the whole place fall apart. He hardly ever comes out of his room. <coughs> Ragnar called to Mr. Walkwell, who was inspecting the place where the helicopter had landed. We must take him to Gideon, Simos. He is the Thane. 
He must know what happened here tonight. No, Colin shouted. If you tell him, we'll all be thrown out. Me and the Jenkins kids, all of us. Tyler took a step forward. He had seldom had such a powerful urge to slug somebody. Shut up, Needle. You think I'm wrong? Colin turned on him. Look at you. You snuck into the fault line. You stole stuff from the library. You brought these kids onto the property. He pointed a shaking finger at the Kareels, who were looking pretty nervous. At least I was trying to help. You were just entertaining yourselves. That's not fair, Lucinda said. Quiet, all of you. Ragnar looked like he'd also like to hit something. Simos, what will we do? Mr. Walkwell was trotting back toward them, hooves picking gracefully at the uneven ground. <coughs> he was carrying something. Things could be worse, he said as he reached them, dropping his burden on the ground at Ragnar's feet. Stillman has left something for us. I do not think he meant to. Ragnar crouched and fumbled open the briefcase. Tyler stared. Steve Carrillo whistled. Oh my God, he said to said. That's like a million dollars? Half a million, Colin corrected her. So, for a while at least, Ordinary Farm is not broken, Mr. Walkwell smiled. Braked? Broke, Tyler said. No, definitely not broke, but isn't Stillman going to come back for it? Ragnar laughed grimly. Stillman will be back, but I think he does not care so much about this. For him, it is uh, a little bit of money only. Still, it will make Gideon happy. I got that money, Colin said shrilly. If anyone's going to give it to Gideon, shut your mouth, or I will shut it hard. Ragnar glared at him. Colin stopped talking. So what do we do, Simos? The big man asked. Um, I've got an idea, said little Alma Carrillo. Everyone turned in surprise to look at her. I mean, if you can't tell Mr. Goldring about how the money really got here, why don't you tell him something else? Tell him those bad guys were trying to buy the farm or something. Hey, sis, you're pretty sneaky, said Steve Carrillo, obviously impressed. For half a million? Tyler shook his head. They wouldn't believe it. A bribe, Lucinda said. She had sat down but sounded all about ready to fall asleep. Tell Gideon that they tried to bribe you, Mr. Walkwell. That you went along with it to find out what they knew, and then you took the money? Gideon will like that, said Ragnar slowly. He will like the idea that Stillman tried to steal our loyalty and failed, and that we kept the gold for him. He frowned. But what will we do with the boy? Tyler swallowed. He hated himself for what he was about to do, but it made sense. Don't do anything. We need Colin. If we turn him in, he's not going to keep his mouth shut, and then everyone's going to be in trouble. Me, Lucinda, the Carrillos, even you guys. We all kept secrets from Gideon. Congratulations, Jenkins, Colin said. You have a brain in that head, after all. Shut up, Needle. It works both ways. If you tattle on us, then we won't just tell Gideon what you did. We'll tell your mother. What? Colin Needle looked like he'd been punched in the stomach. I know you didn't tell her. You're scared of her, aren't you? So just shut up. You don't know about me. I know enough, Tyler said. Now shut up while Wagner and Mr. Walkwell decide what to do. For a long moment, no one spoke. The Carrillos shuffled their feet. Colin stared sullenly at the ground. I think we must keep quiet, Mr. Walkwell said at last. 
Otherwise, the needle boy will be sent away. Those on the farm should stay on the farm. If not, they become a different problem, like Kingari. Where was that name again, Tyler thought? The one even Ragnar was afraid of. What kind of monster was this Kingari? What had he done? So, it seems we make a devil's bargain, as it is called, said Ragnar. Everybody will stay silent about what they know. But Simos and I will be watching you always from now on, Colin Needle. The big man glared at Colin for a moment, then shook his head. Still, we have one other problem to solve. The egg. Gideon thinks Alamu took it. Now we have it again. We will think of something, Mr. Walkwell said. But let us think while we are taking these children back to their beds. For them, this night has gone on far too long. He looked at Tyler and Lucinda, and his normally gravel-toned voice was almost gentle. You are leaving us tomorrow, after all. But what are you going to do with that, that dragon? Carmen Carrillo asked. Is it dead? No, just overcome by sleep medicine, Mr. Walkwell told her. But she does have a deep cut on her wing from that thrice cursed flying machine. It will need many stitches. Ragnar, can you find a big enough tractor over in Canning to carry her back to the sick barn? Carry her back? Tyler was amazed. Where can you find anything that big? You would be surprised. Ragnar said, Meseret is not so heavy as she looks. Her bones are hollow, like a bird's. But uh, first, I suppose you should take the other devil machine and return these children to their own home, Mr. Walkwell told Ragnar. It will be dawn soon. The Carrillos walked back to the farmhouse yet again, this time with Tyler and Silent Colin, wiping his eyes on his sleeve. Mr. Walkwell carried exhausted Lucinda on his back, her head nodding. Ragnar had the backpack with the dragon's egg in one hand and the briefcase full of money in the other. Seems like you guys must have had a pretty interesting summer, said Steve Carrillo. You could say that, Tyler agreed. Yeah, I guess interesting would sum it up pretty well. All right, and the last chapter, chapter 30, one in the other. Well, said Gideon Goldman, wrapped in a clean bathrobe and looking like an ancient king as he stared down the length of the breakfast table, I knew it was going to be a big morning. What were our guests heading back home today? But I didn't expect things to be quite this exciting. The briefcase full of money was in his lap. Meseret's egg sat in a nest of towels at the center of the table, as if it was the main dish. The official story, constructed in haste, was that the she-dragon had sensed when her mate had taken the egg, broken out of the sick barn in fury, and recaptured it. The injury to her wing from the helicopter pl blade was now a battle wound from a scuffle with Alamo. Lucinda didn't like having to lie, especially about things this big. Unable to look at Uncle Gideon, she turned and looked at Colin Neal, who was also avoiding Gideon's eye. Or, perhaps, it was the gaze of his mother, sitting at Gideon's right hand, that he was avoiding. Whichever was the case, Colin had, the pale, had a pale, sickly look, and for the first time since Hanab had told her of Colin's role in the theft of Meseret's egg, she felt sorry for the older boy. He had been stupid, and reckless, and arrogant, but she believed him when he said the farm was important to him. Gideon looked at the briefcase again, then at the egg, and shook his head in disbelief. My goodness, I can't get over it. A dragon fight, attempted industrial espionage, and I slept through it all. He turned to Ragnar. How is Meseret? The blonde bearded man laughed in a hollow way. He was still wearing the same dirty, sweat-stained clothes from the night before. She is sleeping. We've given her more medicine. The tractor man should have a loader and a trailer ready this afternoon. 
I'll bring them back after I take the children to the train station. We'll have her back in the barn by tonight. And the damage? He will be able to fix everything, I think. Mr. Walkwell was leaning in the doorway, dressed and looking almost normal again. He had not bothered to put his newspaper stuffed boots on. His hooves stuck out the bottom of his pants legs. Ah, but it will take time to replace the things for animal medicine and put up new shelves in the sick barn. Most are ruined. Gideon suddenly laughed. Ah, I was going to say it will take money we don't have, but we do have it now. He patted the briefcase. Mercy me. As you can tell, I'm quite surprised by all this. We all are, Gideon, said Mrs. Needle with chilly sweetness. We all are. Another long silence dropped over the table. Lucinda wondered how long it would be until Mrs. Needle squeezed the entire story out of Colin. She had drugged Lucinda and set a vicious, unnatural animal on Tyler. Goodness only knows, oh, goodness only knew what else she could do. And she was Colin's mother. No wonder he acted like he did. It turned Lucinda's stomach. My only sadness, Gideon said at last, is that we have the egg back so we can study it, but we still have no baby dragons and no idea of what the problem is. Something tickled Lucinda's memory but stayed just out of reach. I wish you would let me take a hand, Gideon, said Mrs. Needle. Her hand came to rest on Uncle Gideon's arm like an ivory spider. After all, Rockwell and the Norsemen have failed three times now to keep an egg alive. There are charms that I know, herbs I could give, that ensure healthy births and cows and sheep and even poultry. There is nothing wrong with my care of these animals, said Mr. Rockwell in a flat, angry voice. Suddenly, Lucinda remembered. Wait, maybe the egg isn't dead. What nonsense are you talking, child? demanded Mrs. Needle. Leave these things to your elders. Just a moment, Patience, Gideon said, shaking his arm loose from her clutch as he turned to Lucinda. But what do you mean? She told them how the dragon's thoughts had seemed to stream through her mind as she rode, most of them quite strange and alien, but some of them so clear that she felt she had understood Meseret's meaning. She was thinking about the egg, she didn't think it was dead, just that it needed something to start it moving. Quickening, it is called, said Mrs. Needle, with a certain cold authority. But what does that matter? The, the conceptus has been lifeless each time. There is no life to quicken. It's, it's just... Now Lucinda was embarrassed. What had seemed so clear when she had touched the dragon's thoughts now seemed strange and dubious when she had to explain it, especially with Mrs. Needle staring daggers at her. It, it just felt like she thought there was something she was supposed to do. She thought about breathing on it, breathing fire, but there was something wrong with the shell. Meseret needs to eat something to make the shell, I, I don't know, right, some kind of dirt or rocks or something? Some kind of dirt. Mrs. Needle summoned a tight smile. Surely you misunderstood, Lucinda. After all, you were terrified, struggling for your life. Now, uh, hold, hold on, patience, said Gideon. Animals eat all kinds of things to help themselves. Remember when we kept losing the first basilisks uh, until we found out they needed rocks in their stomach to grind up the bones of their prey? He turned to Lucinda and Tyler. Oh, they eat mice and lizards and whatnot. Just gulp them down, swallow them whole, he informed them with a certain relish, then looked around the room. Where's Hanek? He's the one that came with the dragons. If anyone knows, he will. He did not want to come in to breakfast, said Ragnar. Of course he didn't, Lucinda thought. He's afraid he's in trouble. I will find him, said Mr. Walkwell. It was a pleasure to see him turn and go out the door so swiftly, so gracefully, instead of limping like an accident with them. She hoped he would keep his boots off from now on, around the farm anyway.
Mr. Walkwell returned in only a few minutes with Hanet beside him, looking as though he was trying to become half his ordinary size. Haneb, what are you cowering for, boy? Gideon boomed. We need your help. We want to know about what the dragons ate back in your country. He turned to Lucinda and Tyler. It's part of Turkey now, but for a long time, Haneb's people, uh, the Hittites, had much of it to themselves. Haneb still looked startled and fearful. Eight? Yes, eight, confounded. Did they eat stones? Anything unusual like that? Haneb, oh, sorry, he kept his head down as he thought, his hair masking the scars on his face. He had worked hard to avoid Lucinda's gaze. No stones, he said at last. Nothing strange at all? Haneb winced. I, I am sorry, Master Gideon. I am thinking. He frowned and looked as though he was about to burst into tears. Sometimes they ate earth flax, he said at last. Earth flax? What is that? Describe it, Gideon demanded. <clears throat> Haneb waved his hands. It is like ordinary flax, but it grows in the rock, not in the ground. You can make cloth of it, and the cloth cannot be burned. By God, he's got it, shouted Gideon, making Haneb jump so badly that only Mr. Walkwell's steadying hand kept him from falling over. Asbestos! My goodness, Lucinda, you're right. I am? The mother dragon must eat it to make their eggs fire resistant. Then they heat the eggs up. Some animals lay eggs and sit on them. Dragons turn on their internal flamethrowers and quick roast them. Gideon smacked the table and scowled. But what are we going to do now? How can we find out whether it can still be hatched? We don't have any asbestos. We ripped it all out a few years ago. Had to, or the inspection boys would have been down on us from the county. He shook his head. I wish we'd saved some. Mezaret won't breed on anything for a while, anyway, Ragnar pointed out. The medicine has made her sleep. Perhaps we could make a sort of flamethrower from pipes and the blacksmith bellows Mr. Walkwell uses to fix the wagon, Colin said excitedly. He seemed to have forgotten that a short while ago his entire future had hung by a thread. But we'd have to paint the egg with something that would work as well as asbestos. <clears throat> a throat was loudly cleared. Everybody turned to see Sarah standing in the doorway with Pema, Azinza, and the cave girl Ula, who had spent the last several days following them like a wide-eyed feral cat. Ula caught sight of Tyler and smiled a brilliant smile at him. Sarah's round cheeks were flushed red, but if she was embarrassed to be the center of attention, she still spoke strongly and plainly. If you want something warmed but not burned, why not try talking to the people who do that every day? The girls and I who take some of that very nice paper made of hammered metal, aluminum foil, it is called, said Azinza with queenly condescension. Yes, aluminum foil, and you will wrap it around the egg as though it was a plump turkey. Then you will put it in the oven where we can make it just as hot as we choose for as long as we choose, she shrugged. If it does not offend any of you, that is, after a moment's startled silence, Gideon laughed and clapped his hands. Wonderful! Sarah, you are a genius! That is just what we will do. I should say about 400 degrees. Perhaps 300, Sarah said kindly. It will take longer, but be safer. As you say, as you say, Gideon struggled up from his chair, waving a piece of waffle on the end of a fork. To the kitchen! Tyler and Lucinda were packed, but reluctant to leave, although it was beginning to get close to the time when they'd have to. They hung around the kitchen, as did most of the rest of the farm's inhabitants, all finding excuses to make frequent visits to the scene of the experiment. Even Haneb worked up the courage to come watch. At last, about two hours after they had first put the shiny bundle into the oven, Sarah cracked the door, peered in, and said, 
I think something moved. She and Ragnar, both wearing oven mitts, wrestled the egg out onto a bed of towels on the floor and began to peel off the aluminum foil. A spider web crack had formed on the top. As Lucinda and her brother stared, it bulged in the center and then a piece of the shell popped loose and fell to the towel. She could just hear the cracking of the shell over any, everyone's murmuring voices. She wondered if the heat was necessary to make the egg brittle enough for the baby to break it. Another piece fell off, then another, and a moment later the whole top of the egg cracked loose and swung outward as though hinged. A head snaked out that was no bigger than a small dog's, a tiny version of Meseret with a blunter snout, but with colors that were brighter than hers, horizontal stripes of black and gold. The infant dragon pulled itself awkwardly out of the wreckage of the eggshell and walked a few staggering steps on its wing pinions before stopping to rest, its throat pulsing in and out, its striped tail coiled around it. The golden eyes looked blearily around and seemed to focus on Lucinda. For a moment, she could almost feel its simple, wordless thought. Hmm? No, I'm not your mother, she tried her best to tell the newborn. You'll meet her soon. Someone put a hand on Lucinda's shoulder. It was Gideon, his hair standing up again so that he looked like a scarecrow that had been out in the wind too long. He had his other hand on Tyler and an expression on his face so strange that it gave Lucinda shivers. I have not treated the two of you as well as I should have, he said. Everyone in the kitchen fell silent. Gideon cleared his throat and continued. But this, the young dragon, we thought we'd never see. It makes me realize. As Gideon fell silent again, someone made a noise like a grunt of pain. Lucinda saw Colin Needle standing half in shadow, half in sunlight from one of the big windows, watching. He had his arms wrapped tightly around himself, and even from across the kitchen, Lucinda could almost feel his envy and unhappiness. Tyler suddenly stood up and said, Uncle Gideon, I almost forgot to tell you. I found something in the library, and I wonder if it's anything you recognize. He held out his hand. Lucinda, as surprised as anyone else, stared at Tyler's fingers as they opened to reveal a bit of sparkle. Gideon said, what? Well, what is it? In the library, you say? Yes, near the portrait of Octavio. Gideon took the shining thing from Tyler's hand and stared at it intently. Everyone in the kitchens craned their necks to see. Gideon held up the golden locket on its slender gold chain. You found it? He said, his voice little more than a hoarse whisper. Was it hidden somewhere? Tyler hesitated, looking like he wanted to get something just right. No, not hidden. It was right out in the open, like somebody wanted it to be found. It seemed that all his years had caught up with Gideon at once. His lips, his lip trembled and his eyes were wet with tears. It, it's hers, he said, the necklace I gave her. Grace, oh my beautiful Grace. He lifted the necklace with trembling hands and kissed it. It's a sign. She sent it to me through the fault line somehow. It means she's still alive and she wants me to know it. Tyler was squirming uncomfortably, but Gideon didn't notice. Bless you, boy. Oh, oh, thank God you brought me the greatest treasure of all. My grace is alive. Gideon Goldrin crouched down and took Tyler and Lucinda by the hand. Lucinda couldn't even look at him. She was ashamed of all the lies they were telling him. After a moment, she pulled away, and Tyler did too, but Gideon was oblivious. I fell in love with her when she was just a girl, the old man said, his voice hoarse. But I didn't realize it. Only when she had grown up and I could I finally understand the feelings I had, but her grandfather, old Doc. Octavio fought against us for so long. He didn't want his hired hand 
marrying his granddaughter. Gideon laughed. That's all I was to him, just a young man he'd hired to help him grow crystals. It took years for him to accept me, accept us. And then just when it finally seemed we would be happy, I lost her. I still don't know what happened. I, I had left the farm for the evening, and so had Octavio, who had gone off in his own car. The fool was too old to drive. We told him that a dozen times, but he was too stubborn to listen. So we'd left Grace alone. When I came back late, I found my grandfather-in-law's car half off the driveway, into the undergrowth, and Octavio himself lying beside it, dead of a heart attack. Grace was gone. I couldn't find her anywhere. I, I don't know whether she'd found her grandfather and just wandered off in a daze, or it was just a terrible coincidence. Then Seamus found her tracks in the dust of the silo, tracks that disappeared at the fault line. Worst of all, the continuoscope was just lying there as if she had dropped it before she stepped into the fault. Without it, she was lost with no hope of finding her way back. Gideon fell silent again for a long moment, but she could hear his breath itching. Lucinda, like others in the room, found herself shifting uncomfortably. The poor man. But now... Thanks to you, Gideon said suddenly, I know for certain that she is still alive, that she's trying to communicate with me. He stood up, throwing his arms wide. And we have a baby dragon. Tyler and Lucinda bringing you two to Ordinary Farm just might be the best thing I have done in years. He reached out and captured them again, pulling them into an uncomfortable bony hug. The ancient bathrobe smelled like talcum powder and sweat. Bless you both. Please come back to us soon, next summer for certain. And perhaps you could even visit us at the holidays. Ragnar seemed to take pity on the two of them being squeezed until Lucinda thought she would pass out. They will miss their train, Gideon, he reminded their host. The old man loosened his grip. Behind him, Mrs. Needle was smiling that smile of hers that never reached her eyes. Oh, yes, the dark-haired woman said. Do take care of yourselves until we see you two again. It is such a very dangerous world out there. That doesn't sound like a warning, Lucinda thought. It sounds like a promise. Mrs. Needle was making sure she and her brother knew they had an enemy, one who would not give up the farm without a fight. Oh, we'll definitely remember to stay safe, Lucinda said, then looked right into the frigid gray eyes and smiled back at Mrs. Needle. It was tentative at first, but after a moment it became much easier. And Lucinda's smile didn't reach as far as her own eyes either. Oh, this ran longer than I thought it would. There's like four pages left. I'm going to read them. So we're going a little over instead of under. And this is called The Real World. Whoops. The Real World, Chapter 31. Tyler persuaded Ragnar to take the old truck on a detour to Cresta Soul Farm before they went to the station. As they drew up outside, with Ragnar fretting about them missing their train as nervously as their mother had all those weeks ago, Carmen, Steve, and Alma spilled through the white iron gate and ran up the road toward them. Tyler and Lucinda got out of the truck. We came to say goodbye, Tyler told them. Nobody was smiling. Carmen's long hair was blowing in her eyes. You have to promise us, Tyler said. Us, this time, not just Ragnar and Mr. Walkwell. You have to promise to keep the secrets. Otherwise, we know, said Alma. We talked about it, said Carmen. Yeah, we understand, said Steve, because otherwise everything will change for everyone. We swear we won't tell anyone said Alma, her little face solemn. Not ever, no matter what. Don't forget to write, Lucinda, Carmen said. And you guys come back soon, so we have someone we can talk to about it. None of the children could think of much else to say. Their hearts were too full. They all hugged, then Tyler and Lucinda climbed back into the truck. 
Did all that really happen? Lucinda asked. All of it? You keep saying that. Tyler was looking out the train compartment window at the fields and houses going past and trying to think. There was still so much about the summer he didn't understand. Of course it happened. But look, the sister said, look, Tyler. I am looking. That's not what I mean. She wrapped her hand on the window. Look at what's out there. The real world. That's where we live, not in a television show, not in a movie, not in a storybook. Why us? She leaned in close, lowering her voice so that the man in the baseball cap and the lady with the bag full of knitting materials across the aisle, aisle couldn't possibly hear. Tyler, I rode on a dragon. Tyler grinned. You dangled off a dragon, screaming like a baby, you mean. Shut up. You know what I'm saying. She lowered her voice again. You jumped into a mirror. You went to the Ice Age and came back with a cave girl. She's from like a million years ago or something. And she has a crush on you, Tyler. That's bull. She does not. Besides, what about Colin the criminal? Seems like he rather fancies you, old chap. Lucinda grabbed his arm so hard that it actually hurt. Don't change the subject. You know what I'm saying? How can we just go back to school like none of it ever happened? Tyler was quiet for a long time. We're astronauts, he said at last. No, we're, we're secret astronauts. What are you talking about? Well, astronauts go to the moon or Mars, whatever. Then they come back and they still have to go to the grocery store, right? They still have to mow the lawn and, I don't know, eat and go to the bathroom and stuff, right? They can't just say, hey, I walked on the moon. I don't have to eat and drive a car and do normal stuff anymore, right? I guess so. But everyone knows about them. They get parades and <coughs> people interview them on television. They don't have to pretend like everything's normal. Because everything isn't normal. It isn't. To his astonishment, Tyler saw that Lucinda's eyes were full of tears. After a moment's hesitation, he grabbed her hand. No, it's not, he told her. But that's the secret part. Like spies. They can't come back from a spy mission and say, the most interesting thing happened when I was in the underground hideout of Professor Evil Guy. Because it's secret, right? Just like the farm, and we have to keep it that way. He squeezed her hand before letting it go. It's ours, Luce. Ordinary farm is ours now. We belong there. We earned it, and no one can take it away from us. And we're going back, too, but only if nobody finds out. She took a deep breath. But I'll go crazy if I can't talk to anyone about it. We're asking the Carrillos to do the same thing, aren't we? But they have each other, and you have me. You can talk to me. It's our secret, yours and mine. Lucinda sat back against the seat. She rubbed her eyes dry with the hem of her shirt. But what am I going to tell my friends when they ask me what I did this summer? And what are we going to tell mom? Tyler put his knees up on the back of the seat in front of him and pulled a notebook out of his backpack. It was covered with scribbled notes. We'll, we'll make stuff up. Right now, in fact, we've got a couple of hours. We'll write it down and that way we'll always be, what's that word? Consistent. His big sister looked at him as something like admiration. Wow, Tyler, you really thought about this. We have to, Luce, he said, finding the blank page. This is the most important secret in the world. He looked up. Now, did we go on hay rides? Mom was only a couple of minutes late. She was wearing sunglasses and looked very tan. Kind of glamorous, Tyler had to admit. She was wearing a skirt, too, which wasn't all that usual. There you are, she squealed, running toward them. She wrapped her arms around them. She was shorter than at the beginning of the summer, Tyler couldn't help noticing, which meant he was taller, and gave them a hard hug. 
Oh, I missed you two so much. Did you have a good time? Why didn't you write? We did, Lucinda said. Well, I did. About four or five times. Didn't you get them? I was traveling, remember? She hugged Tyler. Look at you, my big man. You look great, Mom, Lucinda said as she got her own individual squeeze. Really tan. Come along, and you can tell me all your stories. I'm double parked, so we have to hurry. Mom stopped in front of an unfamiliar, shiny car. She lifted the keys and pushed a button, and the trunk popped open. Whoa, Tyler said. Is this new? Mom giggled like a girl and waved her hand. Oh, <laughs> it's not ours. I borrowed it from Roger because mine's in the shop. Roger? Lucinda frowned as she got in. Who's Roger? I met him at the retreat. He didn't even show up until the last week. Lucky me, I was still there. She laughed again. He's so nice. You'll love him. Lucinda looked at Tyler. Tyler looked back. He rolled his eyes and his sister seemed to know just what he meant. Mom was on another one of her, this time everything's going to be great freakouts, which usually happened when she met a new man. Well, it was better than coming back to find her depressed and crying all over the place. So tell me about your summer, Mom said, weaving in and out of traffic in a way that made Tyler wish he had a joystick. Did you have fun? Did you learn things? What did you do? <coughs> Tyler looked at Lucinda and smiled. She smiled back. Pretty much what you'd expect on a farm, he said. Chores, animals, early to bed, early to rise. Oh, and hay rides, right, Luce? Oh, yeah, Lucinda agreed. Lots and lots of hay rides. And that's the end of the book. And I have proved once again, I am no skill whatsoever at judging how long things are going to run when I'm reading them. Anyway, so I am going to shut, shut up shop for tonight. And um, I'm very sorry if there were any uh, audio problems. I, I We really are going to have to move this to another venue because Facebook is really driving me crazy at the moment. Anyway, however, I will be back next week. Um, until further notice, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here same times, 1 a.m., 7 p.m. on Sundays. I thank you for bearing with me through my confusion, my under-reading, my over-reading, all of that stuff. Lovely to see you all. Take good care of yourself, and I will see you next week. Okay, cheers. Peace. Bye.